We'll uh, get started on our next presenter, um, known to you all, I'm sure, uh, either as a grad student in the DCOG HCI lab or uh, as an undergrad in all those uh, 102A, 102B, 102, well, you never do 102C, right? I That's guess. Jim? Jim oh, you I have? Did you did them together. Yeah. Okay, yeah, could have been 102C. You know, where you actually go out and, uh, and, and watch people doing doing what they do, try and figure out why they do what they do, how they do what they do, uh, and how to make the world uh, better. Um, so I thought, uh, you know, since our theme was, you know, people coming together as a community, uh, how do we do things together, you know, what better thing than to uh, talk about some of the communal science that we do. Uh, and actually this next project is about uh, a kind of creature uh, that, uh, that's very social. Um, and so uh, without further ado, I give you uh, Ed Hutchins and Chris Johnson's uh, team of uh, scientists and their Dolphin Cognition Project. Thank you, Shauna. From a cognitive point of view, bottlenose dolphins are very interesting animals. Like humans, dolphins are highly social. They're obviously intelligent and they have a high encephalization quotient. That's actual brain mass relative to the expected brain mass for a given body size. Dolphin EQ is not quite as high as it is in humans, but it's about twice that of chimpanzees. So while alien in habitat, anatomy, and perception, bottlenose dolphins share important traits with humans, such as cooperative foraging and vocal mimicry that may have led to convergence among cognitive strategies employed by the two taxa. In particular, we expect that humans and dolphins may show striking similarities in how the complexities of social attention are managed. Coordinating attention is a necessity for collaborative foraging, and vocal mimicry could be used for, among other things, directing the attention of others to the mimicked individual or event. While a great deal has been learned about human cognition through the study of non-human primates, dolphins are probably more similar to humans in terms of the dynamics of social attention than any of our primate cousins. The few data that exist on dolphin social attention, for example, suggest that unlike non-human primates, dolphins actively teach their young and may point out events of interest to one another. Field observations have shown that alliances of pairs or trios of dolphins often join forces in what are called second order alliances, suggesting that these animals track and coordinate multiple levels of social engagement. They also commonly engage in the type of triadic interactions, including social tool use that are taken in higher primates as a hallmark of Machiavellian intelligence. For example, if animals A and B may reliably exhibit one kind of relationship when animal C is absent and a different kind of relationship when animal C is present. These observations suggest that dolphins attend to the attention of others and that relationships can be embedded in other relationships. This embedding is a hallmark of social complexity. Dolphins have a documented propensity and captivity in the wild for playfulness, flexibility, and innovation. For example, both dolphins and humans surf, while non-human primates do not. <laughs> I have been taking these lessons myself for more than 50 years, and I've come to believe that from the dolphin point of view, humans are kind of getting the hang of surfing, but they're still pretty lame. <laughs> it would be really great to know what is happening in those big dolphin brains while they're engaged in those interesting socio-cognitive activities. Alas, we really don't know, and this is likely to remain a mystery for some time. But there's a lot of really good cognitive science to be done by documenting what dolphins actually do with those big brains. Studying dolphins may look like fun, but it's not easy. This is our friend Denise Herzing, who studies Atlantic spotted dolphins in the Bahamas. The anatomical and lifestyle differences between dolphins and humans make studying dolphins very difficult. At present, partly because of the difficulties of observing dolphins in their nat natural habitat, much less is known about social cognition in these animals than in non-human primates. Our research 
aims to develop new tools for the collection and analysis of data on dolphin social behavior. We expect that insights about human cognition may emerge from a better understanding of the social attention in these large brains, socially interdependent and vocally adept marine mammals. Our unit of analysis is a group of dolphins. We continually ask this question, what information goes where, when, in what form? It turns out it's possible to observe, record, and even quantify much of this. The documentation of coordinated, embodied, multimodal, multi-party interactions among dolphins is simultaneously a specification of the functional requirements of dolphin life, that is, what dolphins must use their brains to do, but it's also simultaneously a specification of a cognitive system in its own right. So what are the mechanisms by which configurations of coordination are created and transformed in dolphins? What are the media via which information moves in these systems? And what emerges from the interactions? That's sort of what is computed by this distributed cognitive system. States of coordination and social relations, of course, but also the outcomes of interactions such as breeding opportunities and the capture of prey. What's possible in the wild is also works for captive dolphins, and here we have a bit more control than in the wild. Dolphins produce a large variety of sounds. Some of these sounds are suspected to play a role in communication. But do dolphin vocalizations have a referential function? Whatever a vocalization may refer to, reference will probably be grounded in social context, but dolphin vocalization has not been investigated in this way in the past. To answer such questions, we would need simultaneous and synchronized data on vocalizations and dynamic social contexts. Who is vocalizing? Which vocalizing is produced? Who is doing what to whom? And we need a lot of that sort of data. So very quickly, the plan for this team presentation is Whitney Friedman will tell us about new tools she is developing to better see, record, and analyze the dynamics of coordinated movement among wild dolphins. I will then describe how we've instrumented a captive dolphin habitat to make extensive audio and video recordings of dolphin social behavior. Next, our undergraduate honors student, Ashley Reese, will describe a particular kind of inter-animal coordination, examining preferences for the use of one eye over the other in social interactions. Now, we cannot see the functional states of the dolphin brain, but we can use knowledge of dolphin brain anatomy to suggest behavioral observations, and the behavioral observations suggest functional properties concerning lateralization of function in the dolphin brain. Jeremy Karnowski will then describe efforts to use computational tools to automate some aspects of our analysis of video and audio recordings. We have a big data problem. Uh, and finally, Chris Johnson will reflect on the kinds of questions we hope to be able to answer using our new suite of tools for recording, visualizing, quantifying, and analyzing dolphin social behavior. So now, let's head out to Shark Bay in Western Australia with Whitney Friedman. Thank you, Ed. Well, uh, taking a note from Ed's study of human cognition in the wild, um, I've gone out to Shark Bay in Western Australia to conduct my dissertation fieldwork, where I've joined a 30-year longitudinal study on bottlenose dolphins. And um, one of the major findings from this study is that the males in this society form what we call a nested alliance structure. And this has been described as possibly one of the most complex animal societies outside of our own. Um, so. At the first order of alliance formation, pairs and trios of males work together to capture and consort individual females during the mating season. Uh, these associations, uh, some of these associations have been seen to last over 20 years. But in addition to belonging to a first order alliance, uh, most males also belong to a larger group, a second order alliance of four to 14 individuals. These groups also work together to steal and defend females from other males in these giant competitions. Um, but like the first order, some associations can be stable for over 20 years. We just saw a group last field season, 2013, that was first photographed in 1989, 
They were still competing last year. But they show some really interesting differences um, in terms of their relatedness and size. Now, if that wasn't enough, uh, these males are also grouping up in what we call a third order of alliance formation. So that's when two second order alliances work together to steal or defend a female from another second order alliance. So here's two second order alliances up here, the Crockers and the Primas. These are my focal groups. Um, and occasionally what we see is that they work together in competition against other second order alliances, <laughs> like these guys, the WoW crowd. Um, these are the most recently discovered and the least well understood um, of the orders of alliances. Now in 30 years, um, the researchers have done a really incredible job of describing the associations among the dolphins and their relationships, as well as the social structure that they, that they form. But as Ed alluded to, it's really difficult to, um, to study the interactions among the dolphins, and that's because they occur underwater and we don't. <laughs> So, <laughs> but of course, that's what we want to look at. And, uh, and in particular, this study looks at a class of interaction called social coordination. Um, the particular types of that we're looking at are synchrony, petting, which is probably like grooming among primates, uh, formations that we see, and also displays. Uh, you may be wondering why this is of interest to a cognitive scientist. Um, and. Uh, and the reason is that, uh, again, as Ed, as Ed pointed out, these configurations are cognitive states of these larger socio-cognitive systems. And they're distributed. Uh, none of these states could be accomplished by a single individual. Uh, so the cognitive process is distributed among the individuals in this interaction. They likely play a role in the mediation of social bonds and reproductive success. So they're important to the species themselves. That's important to us. And they show organizational differences. And finally, we can describe them using analytical methods. So our study questions are, first and foremost, are relationships mediated by social coordination? And then how does the production of social coordination vary among allies? And finally, by what process is social coordination achieved? You may recognize these questions as related to other big questions in cognitive science, uh, like what are the semiotic resources? How is social coordination enacted? in the interactions among individuals. And of course, what information goes where, when, and in what form? Now, I, I noted we had a problem earlier. <laughs> we want to study these interactions, but we can't see them. So over the last few years, uh, we've been drawing on some a, a handful of, uh, of studies in the past to develop these uh, smaller and less expensive aerial systems. And uh, we've been able to develop a system that's three to five times less expensive than uh, any preceding systems, which means that um, behavioral researchers and non-government uh, funded uh, necessarily projects can, can be capturing these data underwater. So we're pretty excited about that. Um, and in a minute, I'll show you some of what we're capturing. Uh, in the last two years in particular, I've collected uh, over 140 hours of focal follows on those, those 15 males that I showed you earlier, the crockers and the primas. Uh, each of those focal follows include, uh, included a five-minute activity scan, vocal annotations, lots of me talking, uh, underwater acoustic recordings, a continuous GPS track, aerial video, and, uh, and deck video. So what are we seeing? Well, um, the aerial video is providing us, first of all, a 17% advantage over what we can capture using the deck video alone. Um, but of course, this advantage isn't just quantitative, it's also qualitative. We're, um, we're seeing totally different things from, uh, from the aerial camera than we were uh, from the deck video. I don't know how well you can see this, but I promise there's some better examples coming up. But on the left-hand side, you're seeing the video that we've recorded from the deck of the research boat. And on the right, um, you may be able to see nine dolphins um, engaging in two different types of uh, coordinated interaction um, underwater. So that's pretty remarkable. We're excited about that. And uh, here's just a couple other clips, uh, types of things that we can see, hopefully. Mm, OK, or on this one. OK, so this is, uh, this is a male alliance, a trio, that's um, consorting a single female. She's the one at the point of that interaction. That was a direction change. And she, they're in formation. So we want to know more about how those interactions are negotiated among the individuals. Uh, to get at that, we're doing kind of a threefold uh, type of analysis. and. Uh, so the first one is using um, video analysis. I'm working with a really incredible team of undergraduates. 
uh, to identify social coordination events and to look at the distribution of those events by behavioral context and by group composition, as well as the sequential organization of these, of these events. Um, we're also uh, working together to look at, to use uh, methods like computer vision and uh, information metrics to first track and identify the dolphins and then to look at the dynamics of those dolphins and, and quantify these social coordination events. Oh, sorry, there's quantifying social coordination events and yes, okay, we already got there. <laughs> Uh, and finally, um, finally, again, working with a, with a great team of UCSD undergraduates, uh, we're doing acoustic analysis to detect acoustic events that um, may be happening concurrently, or maybe not, with these social coordination events to look at their timing and production. And just really quick, what you're seeing up here is a spectrogram. It's a representation of the audio data where the time is on the x-axis and the frequency is on the y-axis and the intensity of the vocalization is represented by the I'm um, sorry, the, the amplitude of the vocalization is represented by the intensity of the lines that you see. So we're using these three different methods again to, to look at our study questions and, um, and the larger question to which these contribute, what information goes where, when, and in what form. I have a lot of people to thank, but uh, I'll let the next person go ahead. Thanks, Whitney. That was uh, that was great. Um, so that's in the wild. Uh, Chris Johnson got us hooked up with the uh, dolphin habitat at the uh, Brookfield Zoo, a part of the Chicago Zoological Society. And I, I just want to make a shout out here to the curator of marine mammals there, Rita Stacy, who made this possible for us to do the work, and also the IT staff there who worked with me to set up the. Uh, equipment I'm going to show you here. Um, we're recording audio and video of these captive bottlenose dolphins. Uh, it's in a habitat that has four pools with four narrow gates connecting the pools. Uh, there's about a million gallons of water in there. That You can think of that as the spatial boundaries of our cognitive system. Uh, there's six bottlenose dolphins in there. And because they can move from tank to tank, we see fission and fusion, which is typical of uh, group composition changes in the wild. Um, you can see that the physical layout of the pools and the movement of animals among the pools puts constraints on the flow of information among the animals, and that creates differential access for each dolphin to information about the others. Uh, we've instrumented the pool with three uh, high-resolution hydrophones, one in each of the large pools. Um, there are also viewing windows through which uh, visitors to the zoo as well as the zoo staff can look at the animals and that allows us to place cameras outside the pools, outside the windows, but aimed into the pool, which we have done. So we have instrumented this habitat with 13 video cameras. So here's two lengthwise views. We have uh, two specific gate views, uh, two other cross views. So here's our coverage of the main pool. The little black triangles are our blind spots, we have pretty good coverage. And we use that to measure where the dolphins are, and that's critical because location determines what kinds of information can pass from one dolphin to another. Uh, auditory information, visual information, and these are really embodied creatures, so uh, tactile information, uh, co-location changes that as well, and Chris Johnson will tell you even uh, some amazing stuff about a kind of tactile contact they make that we don't do. Um, in the back pools, uh, we have an additional seven cameras, um, and that gives us good coverage of the entire habitat. Uh, this is sort of what our uh, video display, uh, we have a live link there at times. This creates a huge trove of data. Uh, those 13 video feeds, we've been recording eight hours a day, basically for 14 months. Uh, I estimated that at a little over 40,000 hours of video. So you need lots of undergrads. To, uh, well, we have lots of undergrads, but it turns out that we also need to use some computational techniques to filter the data for the good stuff. That's moments that might merit the attention of an expert human. So one thing that we did, this is a simple thing I did fairly early on, is a, a computer vision program uh, that looks at, um, here's just looking at four windows, and you see down below four timelines. This, by the way, is in a, uh, 
video analysis application called Chronovis that was created by one of Jim's recent PhD graduates, a guy named Adam Faust. It's a really terrific tool. Uh, but what we're seeing up here is, uh, we can see as our timeline moves along, uh, we're just plotting in this window how much activity there is in the window so we can tell when dolphins are present. And so that's just a, a way to start to manage uh, the complexities of having uh, so much data. Uh, I want to turn this over now uh, to Ashley Reese, who will tell us about visual preferences. And, oh, I should say, these dolphins circle the tank often in pairs or groups. And Ashley's question is, do they have a preference for their circling partners or anything else about circling behavior? And if we're lucky. Thank you for that introduction. So I'm studying visual preferences and circling behavior, as Professor Hutchins said. Um, so vision in bottlenose dolphins is pretty different than in humans. Um, one of the main things is their eyes are located on the sides of their head, so laterally, whereas in humans we see facing forward. So one of the advantages when their eyes are located laterally is that they can see 340 degrees around them, so both in front and behind their bodies. Um, and Another difference between how human brains are connected to their eyes and how dolphin brains are is that in bottlenose dolphins, each eye sends signals only to one hemisphere. Um, and then within that, the corpus callosum, which connects both hemispheres, is actually smaller in bottlenose dolphins relative to other mammals of that brain size. And so that kind of suggests that maybe there's some sort of lateralization in vision in bottlenose dolphins. So previous studies have kind of looked at this idea of lateralized vision. And so one of the studies showed the dolphins unfamiliar objects that they had never seen before. And those dolphins tended to, to look at those objects with their right eye. Another study showed a group of dolphins um, strangers that they'd never seen before, and then also familiar humans like the trainers, and they found that the dolphins used their left eye to look at, at these humans. Um, so while these studies are great and they give us some sense that maybe there's a preference for using one eye over another, um, they presented these dolphins with stimuli. And so I wanted to look at a more observational study, and so my research question for my thesis was, how do dolphins use their eyes in social context when they, when they swim together and how they use their eyes when they look at each other? So I studied the dolphins over 26 days using the video recordings that were set up, um, and I looked at them in the morning. And so that's an example of a group configuration that I was looking at. And so what I recorded was who the dolphin was, which eye they were using, which visual field and eye they were using, um, their body orientation. So the dolphin in front, for example, is inverted. Um, and then their spatial position in the tank. So where they are, are they next to the wall in the tank? Um, where they are in relation to each other, are they above or below? And so the dolphin in front that's inverted, actually its right eye, um, the other two dolphins are in its right visual field. And then the pair of dolphins in the back one has its left eye towards the other dolphin, and the other has its right eye. So these are the things that I would look at and record. And I'm currently analyzing the data, um, but if a few preliminary results that I found are just that who the dolphin is swimming with matters, um, which makes sense to think about. And so when the mother swims with her juvenile daughter, how she positions herself in the tank and with the other dolphin varies than when that same mother swims with the other adult male in the tank. And so again, how my visual access vary by their position in the tank. And so are they against the wall? Um, and, and how, like, what other dolphins can they see when they're swimming in the tank? And so my study looked at how dolphins use their eyes when they swim together in a in a tank at the Brookfield Zoo, but it would also be interesting to extend this study about eye preference in other social contexts. So when they're aroused, when they're chasing each other, or when a group of males is courting a female, um, questions like that. And it's important to understand dolphin vision because 
dolphin, um, dolphins use their vision very differently than how humans use their vision. And it's important if you want to understand how they organize themselves socially and also understand how they perceive their world, we need to understand questions like visual preferences. Thank you. Thanks, Ashley. That was great. Um, our next speaker is uh, Jeremy Karnowski. I think of Jeremy as being our chief designer of coping strategies for our massive data corpus. Jeremy. Thanks, Ed. Um, so now I want to go into some of the methods that we are using to analyze this massive amount of uh, video and audio data. Um, so in analyzing the dolphin video data, um, we're looking at the question of who's with whom. So how we're doing that is we're creating a ground truth data set. Um, we're tracking the dolphins between different pools. And we're trying to track the dolphins in 3D. In analyzing the dolphin audio data, we're asking the question about who is vocalizing. And this also entails creating a ground truth data set, um, doing some whistle detection in the audio, and then trying to learn relationships about the whistles through whistle clustering. So first, let's start with some of the video analysis. Um, we have a set of researchers who have been trained in IDing the dolphins and the video footage using markings on their body. Using these identities, they record when these individuals transfer between pools and give a ground truth for the changes in dolphin configurations. One cue that humans reliably use for transfer detection is that when a dolphin is not present, the pixels are lighter and the intensity is higher in the image. When a dolphin is in the gate, the pixels are darker and the intensity is lower. So to do this in an automatic way, we can define a region of interest and chart pixel intensities over time. You'll notice from the 10 minutes that we used, every time a dolphin goes into the gate, the intensity drops and a potential crossing is detected. So while we are capturing the dynamics of configuration changes by observing transfers between pools, we want to go one step further and try to see if we can capture the 3D movements of dolphins in our pools. So what this first entails is detecting and tracking dolphins within one camera view and then later integrating the cameras together. So to do this, we use a technique called robust principal component analysis that has been used in detecting and tracking humans in surveillance video cameras. With RPCA, a video with a static background can be de decomposed into a background, a foreground, and a little bit of noise. We did this th with the video of our dolphin pools. Given our original image, we obtain a static background and the dolphin foreground. Using these regions that contain foreground dolphins, we can go back to our original image and track the dolphins through the pools. By tracking and recording the locations of the dolphins in the video over time, we can construct a heat map that provides information about where the dolphins prefer to move through their environment, sort of like those paths through campus that we heard earlier. In the heat map on the left, yellow represents locations where you're less likely to see the dolphins, while red represents the locations where you're more likely to see one. What you'll notice is that the dolphins don't traverse uniformly. There are patterns to where they swim. If we take a slice of this heat map, you'll notice a bimodal distribution, indicating that Dolphins prefer to swim near the top and the bottom of the pool. This regularity related to social behavior was something that was predicted by Chris Johnson. And I think working with biologists with big data is definitely something we need to do and you just can't do data by itself. Um, so now we'll go into some of the methods that we're using for audio analysis. So dolphins make a wide range of vocalizations. A common way to view vocalizations is produce a spectrogram. The x-axis represents time, while the, the y-axis represents the frequencies that are present in the sound. Many colors can be used, but here red indicates the amplitude of the frequency. The most widely studied vocalization, the whistle, is a frequency modulated sound. When shown in a spectrogram, it produces a line or a contour over time. It is thought that for whistles, the contour contains the relevant information to the dolphins. One particular type of vocalization that has been most widely studied is the signature whistle. The signature whistle is defined as an individually distinctive, stereotyped whistle that is often the most predominant whistle type produced by an individual bottlenose dolphin. For instance, as you can see, one study showed that when sounds A, B, C, and D were recorded, they were made by distinct individuals. But, but, but while 80 to 90% of the time, a signature whistle is made by its signator, 
The other dolphins sometimes use this sound. In general, we are interested with when and how these copies are used. My specific question, though, is whether we can determine the identity of the vocalizer based on the variation between individual vocalizers. One recent study collected evidence that when a dolphin mimics another signature whistle, there are enough differences that we might be able to use those differences to determine the identity of the dolphin. So here are two different sounds. The contours look slightly different. One's a little bit longer, even, even longer, even though the scales are slightly different. This study, though, only had 12 whistle copy events. We'll need a lot more instances of that if we want to automatically detect these differences. Um, each dolphin in our community also has a signature whistle, and these are good examples of them. We use trained observers to detect and recognize the different signature whistles in our population, and then annotate those whistles in the audio. This provides a ground truth data set with which we can test our automated methods. Our automated methods start with detecting whistles. This is work I'm doing with Carmen Dijkstra. Um, she was here in the UCSD Cognitive Science program and is now in a machine learning program, um, graduate program um, in Scandinavia. There are different methods for detecting whistles in the audio. Um, this difference between deciding what's your signal and what's your noise. Um, one method that we are investigating focuses on the pieces that we don't want, the noise, and removing those aspects of the audio. This is how we are currently doing it. So given three channels of audio, um, we take one channel of audio and we have our noisy audio segment. We can then filter that audio and subtract off the average um, intensity over time. Then we threshold the spectrogram and um, obtain a set of audio segments where there were detected sounds. Um, additionally, since we are focusing on determining the tank from which the whistle was made, we want to remove any softer duplicates on the other channels. Um, so as you can see here, we have the channels 1, 2, and 3, and channels 1, 2, and 3 of the um, detection algorithm. And even though there are sounds that are on channel 1, they're not detected because they're sort of the duplicate softer versions. And this is nice because it also produces the side effect of um, generating a large corpus of whistles that are all unique. Um, so we compared our algorithm to the ground truth annotations made by the humans. We, retain, or we obtained a recall of about 82%. And this is a measure that tells us of how much, how much of the whistles that were actually there were detected. And we, re we, we um, obtained a precision of about 70%. And this tells us how many whistles that we detected were actually whistles and not something else. Um, and this is going to get better. We're continuing to construct methods that have higher performance. So this detection procedure produces a large amount of whistles. But how does this compare with the state of the art? As technology improves, Research are able to accumulate larger and larger data sets with whistles num whistle numbers in the thousands. The largest study that I found was the Sarasota Dolphin Project, which studies vocalizations in the wild. They have a collection of over 204 and 23 minutes of audio hand coded. So that's where those undergrads come in. Um, <laughs> Um, this process is very time consuming and it took um, over 25 years to do and it produced a data set of over 10,000 whistles. So I recently used our detection algorithm on two weeks worth of data and we obtained a data set of over 20,000 whistles. Um, and as we do this with you know, our 14 months of data, this is only going to grow. So, in order to find variation within one signature whistle, let's say um, the signature whistle of Chinook here, we need to extract all different versions of that whistle. So all those different ones in the bottom are being classified by humans as the same example. So how are we going to grab those out of our large data set? Uh, we use something called dynamic time warping. It's a way to determine the similarity between two whistles to give it a distance metric. It's related to the Levenstein edit distance when you're comparing symbols of strings like DNA. Um, it looks for optimal comparison between two time series, allowing insertions in both. And the remaining error between the time series is the distance between those two whistles. So for instance, here you have two whistles. They've been aligned. And then you can see that these are pretty similar. So we did this with our data set. We took some known examples of Chinook whistles. And we compared them against all of those other whistles that we found um, to get a, a set of Chinook whistles. So in numbers, that means we reduced that giant set of over 20,000 whistles down to 1,320 versions of um, Chinook-like whistles. And you'll notice that number is already very similar to the large data sets that contain all of whistles in the study. 
Um, so we want to find features in those whistles that help us distinguish subtypes of the Chinook whistle. A histogram of one feature, the maximum frequency of the whistle, produces a, a multimodal distribution. So if we take um, whistles from different parts of those distributions and plot them so that their maximum frequency is aligned, we obtain a visualization of the, some of the different versions of Chinook's whistles, which align with some of the um, findings of the biologists, um, so that helps us out a little bit. Um, our, our hypothesis is that these different whistle versions are produced by different dolphins. Um, in order to test this, we'll be finding moments in time when these versions of the whistles are made. Some of those moments might be when a dolphin is alone in a tank by itself, which gives us a very clear indication that that is this very specific dolphin that made that sound. Um, and we expect to find that those different versions are, um, to be, are they're matched with different individuals. But, of course, this might not be the case. Um, there are definitely different versions of the sound, but um, it might also be that these different versions are related to social situations or um, activities that are going on in the tank. And by looking at moments before and during and after those sounds are made, we could um, determine if that's the case. Um, this would still be a great advance to the field because nothing is known about signature whistle variations, about how signature whistle variations are used, and it's going to be pretty exciting this coming this summer. Okay, um, and now batting cleanup on our team is uh, Chris Johnson, our inspiration and leader. <laughs> oh, thanks, Ed. Um, yeah, so uh, this would normally be the point in the program where I tell you our results, but since we don't have those yet. <laughs> I'm not in a position to do that yet. You'll have to come see us in the end of summer when we've actually finally put together this, all the data that we've collected so far on who's where in the tank and who's making what whistles. And we'll start to be able to actually tell you something about what we found. So instead, for now, I want to talk a little bit about, um, I want to go back and think a little bit about some of the tools that we're using, in this case, some of the conceptual tools. Uh, and I want to do this by starting uh, to just reminding you of some of the things that Ed mentioned in his introduction about uh, what it is that we're looking for when we study a cognitive ecology. Uh, you'll remember that we, from this point of view, we take cognition as embodied and multimodal as um, distributed and multi-party, as emerging through interaction, and that our job in this case then is to see if we can track, observe, and track information flow. And so I want to talk a little bit about some of the, um, the ways that these tools, these conceptual tools, have been honed to address the particular problems that we're faced with in this study. Um, first of all, by recognizing that a signature whistle is a multimodal event. Um, most often people talk about the signature whistle as the actual contour, the sound that's made, but in fact, whenever a signature, a signature gives a whistle, that signature's body is also present and visible to the others in the, in the tank, how it's moving, where it's positioned relative to other animals or objects in the tank. And um, as well as the identity of that animal, which uh, is visually available in the way that it looks, but also is based on a history of interaction that the animals have with this, with this individual. And this uh, configuration of, um, of multimodal configuration repeats uh, with these thousands of whistles, the thousands of times that an animal gives its own signature. Uh, co-occur again and again and again so that on the cases when we have a signature whistle being used by the non-signator, as we've mentioned, these dolphins are vocal mimics and do sometimes produce the signature of other animals. In that case, the same contour, when it's produced in the absence of the signator, uh, you know, since Pavlov's drooling dog, we've known that a repeated co-occurrence of elements of configuration um, leads to a similar response to a single element. So the presence of this contour, even in the absence of the animal itself, uh, makes those absent aspects 
pertinent to whatever happens next. Another way to think about this is to say that given the multimodality of experience, in a very real sense, the signator is partially present in the whistle alone. And for us, what this amounts to is iconic reference. So we would make the case that if indeed we do find this use of non, uh, uh, signature whistles by non-signators that we're potentially looking at um, a situation in which iconic reference is happening. Now, um, I'll come back to this concept in a minute, but I want to move on to talk a little bit about what it means to be multi-party and distributed in this case. In particular, we're looking at who uses whose call, when and with whom, and of course this comes back to Ed's question about what information goes where or when. And um, basically, we can see this um, falling out in a few different ways. There can be dyadic interactions where the signator itself gives its own call, and then the non-signator responds with that same call. And this is actually one type of non-signator use that has uh, been uh, it's the only type so far that's been discussed in the literature, uh, that there is this occasional matching of a signature whistle by somebody else. Uh, it can also be the case, though, that the non-signator calls first. We've already seen a number of cases like this in our, in our corpus. Um, and that raises the question, is this some way to solicit the, the participation of the signator? Is it calling out to them, asking them to come over? The keepers tell a story that sometimes if uh, somebody is, hasn't showed up when they're about to do a show and one of the animals is lagging in one of the back tanks, uh, one of the dominant animals will give that animal signature whistles as if to call them to station, get on with us so we can go on with the show. Um, so we would like to be able to get some kind of systematic documentation of this. Another option is more polyadic interactions, and these are ones that I'm particularly interested in, where the non-signator uses this call with a third party. Uh, I'll get back to this in a minute and talk about what I think some of the implications of this sort of interaction might be. But um, I want to talk about, uh, since we're thinking of this in terms of a cognitive ecology, I think a good, it's a good policy to always to go back to nature and to think about what the socio-ecology of the animals themselves is so that we can, we can make sure that we're approaching this problem in a way that's relevant to their own, the problems that they face in, a, in, a, in their real lives. Uh, and one, type, one feature of dolphin socio-ecology is this tendency to, to um, exhibit fission fusion. Basically what this means is that subgroup membership changes. It sorts and reassorts and reassorts. So on Monday you might hang out with, blue might hang out with orange here, but on Tuesday orange goes over with the other group, and on Wednesday they're back together, but green is with them, and so on. So this is something that's been well described in the field. Um, and it sets up certain kinds of uh, situations that the animals are able to exploit and put some pressure on them to develop ways of coping with this sort of fission-fusion organization. Um, in particular, it, uh, one of the things that it does is it provides differential access to information. That is, uh, some animals are a witness we have access to who else is doing what across multiple, multiple modalities, while other animals maybe didn't have that same access. Um, one way to think about access, or there are many ways to think about access at Brookfield, um, thinking again about the, this multimodality of experience, the various sensory and motor uh, capacities these animals have, we can look at this ecology in terms of what kind of passive listening access the animals have, being able to hear one another's sounds, uh, visual access, whether they can see one another, sonar access, their ability to echolocate, the sonar beam comes out of their forehead, they can direct that at one another to, to um, uh, determine the location and content of, of a particular object or animate object, uh, as well as um, tactile access where they actually can touch. And these different kinds of access vary across the different parts of the tank. So passive listening, for instance, we assume pretty much happens everywhere. That is because the water is contiguous throughout these four tanks. Most of the time, probably any sound made in the back tank can be heard in the adjacent tanks and even out in the front tank, for instance, although these different in shading here are meant to 
to indicate how, how much softer the, the sound may get as it moves from tank to tank. And we see this across, as Jeremy showed you, across the different hydrophones, uh, one of the ways that we determine where sound has been made. Um, these can be vocalizations or percussion sounds, like the jaw clap that they make, it's an aggressive sound, or slapping the surface of the water. Uh, some of the sounds we found are very quiet. They seem to be more intimate conversation type sounds that don't seem to pass through uh, the rest of the tank. And we're going to be looking at the diff which different kinds of sounds they tend to use in this soft voice versus in their louder voices. Um, another type of access, visual access, is of course any two animals in the same tank have visual access to each other. Uh, but we noticed that uh, and these, of course, give them access to gestures, to instrumental actions that they do, to displays of attention that they show. And, of course, they also gain this sort of access through the gates. And uh, one of the things that we are particularly interested in looking at is, is what the keepers have always called gate guarding, which is where the animals hang out in the gate, sort of peek into what's happening in the back tanks. They spend a lot of time apparently monitoring one another through the gates. Um, and so we're going to be doing a systematic look at that. Um, echolocation access, as I say, it comes out of their forehead, and so uh, this is a way to, uh, for them to, they have to have sort of a direct line to the animal they're echolocating on. And one of the things about this is that echolocation actually has a tactile impact. They can punch each other with sound or tickle one another with sound, uh, and um, so the closer they are, they sound, some of these sounds can reach 200 decibels. And I've been hit by 200 decibels of sounds, not fun. Uh, but they do this sometimes in fun and sometimes in, in aggressive contexts. So um, that's another type of access that you can get. And of course, another type of tactile access is actually touching bodies. So with all these different kinds of access in mind, uh, this notion of what it is to witness, we'll see, is specific to the kind of modality that you're talking about. Um, in addition, we're interested to, in the idea of not only of witnessing an event, but also of witnessing witnesses to an event. Who sees who seeing who see what? Or who, <laughs> I guess. Uh, so for instance, uh, in this case, Animal A has access to animal B having access to animal C and D. A may be able to know that C and D are in the med pool there because he can hear them, but he can't see them from the main tank, but he can, because he knows acoustically that they're there and he can see that B is pointing towards them, he can see that B must be able to see C and D and so on. When we studied this in the chimpanzees, um, we found, for instance, that animal B if it was a bonobo, might act in some way to conceal its attention towards C and D when A was watching it. And then when A wasn't watching, then it could go ahead and show that attention to C and D. Um, so we're very interested to see if the dolphins are doing the same sort of embedding of their access or how much their behavior is affected by who has access to whom. Um, so this idea of differential access to information, uh, as I just hinted, impacts also on the way they alter their, their behavior. So they m act in certain ways that gain them access. Uh, this heat map that we showed you a little earlier, I think is a really nice illustration of this. The dolphins pass either, the, what, what we're looking at right here is a, the gate, the window, sort of into the back pool. And we see that the dolphins either uh, go out of their way to pass right by the window and often turn their head when they go by to peek to see who's back there. Or else they minimize access by swimming at the bottom of the tank where no one from the other pool would be able to see them. The line of sight does not extend all the way to the bottom of the pool, so by passing along the bottom, that keeps them out of the line of sight. Um, so we hope that these sort of data and others will um, confirm that indeed a, a lot of their social organization just when they're moving around in the tank is actually affected by what kind of access that they have or what kind of access they're allowing others to have. 
Um, there are, of course, ways of redress, redressing this information differential between the animals. Uh, in a competitive situation, um, this has been discussed in terms of developing deception, like, as I mentioned before, concealing who it is that you're showing attention to. This notion has been well developed in the idea of Machiavellian intelligence, that people have argued, for instance, that this the evolution of the ability to conceal or misinform that we see in primates may be one of the driving features in the emergence of uh, the level of sophisticated social attention that you see in primates. Uh, so we're interested to see if the dolphins show similar <laughs> levels of Machiavellian intelligence. Um, but the, the thing that sets the dolphins apart from most of the non-human primates is that they also had this uh, collaborative, cooperative side, which is less common in primates. And this the argument goes in our prehistory may have helped to select for our um, tendency to inform one another. If you're collaborating with someone and you have information, you have access to information that they don't have, there's some selective pressures there for you to, to provide that information to others, which may be, have been the, the origins of language, for instance, or played into the origins of language. And it certainly is a distinguishing feature about us that we show and tell. This is something that non-human primates just don't do. I'm very much into the continuum between non-human primates and ourselves, but this is one of those lines that I've been forced to draw. Uh, non-human primates don't show each other things. They don't tell each other about stuff. They pay attention to the attention of others and follow their attention, but they don't act to direct the attention of others, which we do, and there's some hint from other research that the dolphins do as well. So this is, of course, necessary for language learning. If you want somebody to learn the word leaf, you have to be able to direct their attention to the leaf and say leaf right when they look at it. Uh, and of course, there are combinations here in secrets and lies uh, that combine both these competitive and cooperative um, aspects. So this is very much uh, of interest to us to see whether this is happening in the animals. And I think Brookfield Zoo actually provides a setting where fission fusion is commonplace and readily observable as the animals move around from tank to tank and therefore have this differential access. Um, so there's many opportunities for them to both attain and redress differential access. And so we're hoping by tracking who's where and saying what that we can track this information flow in the system. Um, just as one example, one final example of this, um, if the animals are configured like this, where you have an animal with this signature in the front who's paired up with an animal with this signature, and this animal is a witness to their being a pair, then if you get a change in configuration, like this, where one animal goes into another tank, one of our questions is what happens then? Is there by any chance where this animal might, by, by providing the signatures of those two animals together to a third party, uh, they could be sort of brokering information and informing the third party something about the original pair. So what this question amounts to is, can dolphins use imitations of another's vocalizations and behaviors to make reference to those animals and thereby inform others about them. That is, can the third party broker information? We'll see. <laughs> Thank you very much. I'm torn, you know, Gilles was encouraging us to have more time for questions, but the previous presentation went so far over that <laughs> <laughs> I, I think one would be the maximum and zero is probably even a better number because uh, Jim Holland and Don Norman have important things to say to us. So I, I would like to say, if you have a question for anybody on the Dolphin team, catch us during the reception and, and uh, let's just turn this over to uh, Jim. I think, and then, and then Don. <laughs>